coming up on Doctype, we're going to show you some tips and tricks for grid-based design. Then, want to make your app more responsive but don't know where to start? Stay tuned for some Ajax 101. So break out the Choco Tacos because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Scrum and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. It's our dozenth episode, number it is, 12. It is our dozenth episode. <laughs> right. Anyway, last week we uh, launched a little bit of a site update. That's right, we, we launched a little bit of a design refresh, if you will, and we actually have a homepage now. I don't know if you noticed, but we didn't have a homepage before at all. And I think that's pretty good testament to, you know, just launching a site and not waiting until it's it's perfect. We're just sort of building it as we need it. So, you know, episode one, we only had one page on the site. There was no episode list or way to navigate back and forth. So, you know, while we have time, we hack together new things. And if you have any ideas for improvements, you know, things that would make Doctype more useful to you, leave us a comment and see what because we always want to improve. Yeah, yeah. We, we also have uh, direct download links now, too. It's, it's right next to the uh, comments, so check it out. Anyway, uh, this episode we're going to be talking about grid-based design, and we're going to be taking it back to school with a little bit of Ajax 101. Let's get into it. Sometimes it can be difficult to figure out how you're going to lay out the elements on your page, but using a grid system can make things a lot easier. In episode 4 of Doctype, I talked about some CSS frameworks, most of which were based on a grid system. What I did not talk about, however, is how you can leverage a grid system to develop the visual structure of your page. Grids can help you create clear visual hierarchies when dealing with the usual suspects like headers, navigation bars, and sidebars. They can also help you clean up some of the visual friction on a page, especially when you're trying to guide the user's attention towards one place or another. Typically, a grid-based design is a fixed width, and the grid is made up of columns and gutters. The gutters are the space between the columns, and they're usually not as wide as the columns are. You don't have to use a grid, but you just have to be careful to avoid situations where the elements on your page look scattered and unrelated. When you line things up, it makes it easier for your visitors to understand how one page element relates to another. Now I've heard some designers say that a grid has the potential to make your site look too boring, and this can easily happen if you're not careful, but it's easily avoidable if you just break the rules a little bit. Most of your page elements will probably line up with the columns or rows in one way or another, but the grid is really just a guideline. After you've designed your basic layout, try to allow for some elements to break outside the grid. Sites that use an illustrative style or subscribe to the grunge trend should break outside the grid more frequently to add more personality and character to the page. Breaking outside the grid can be especially useful when you want to draw attention to something. For example, usually when a designer wants a user to click on something, like a call to action button, they'll just make it a different color than the rest of the site. However, it can be much more powerful if you deliberately break outside the grid. Utilizing an unusual shape can help as well. There are lots of grid systems, grid generators, frameworks, and templates out there for you to use. I'm personally a big fan of Blueprint, although I know a lot of designers that like the 960 grid system at 960.gs. There's also a lot of Photoshop templates that can help you create mockups. Check out the show notes for more resources. When we come back, Jim is going to show you how to mix it up with some Ajax. If you're working on projects, you want to stay organized and make sure you're working on the right things. That's where Scrum can help. Scrum uses Scrum methodology to help you plan your work and make sure you keep on delivering. Drag and Drop Everywhere makes quick work of adding releases, sprints, user stories, and tasks. Scrum also allows you to designate your product owner, your Scrum master, and your Scrum team members, and it brings full transparency to all your projects. Get started for free with the Indie Plan over at scrummed.com. Ajax has become a major feature for most web applications. We're going to get down to the basics of this indispensable tool. When the web was born, it was navigated by moving page to page, each time loading a full HTML page. As the web evolved and began to support more rich interactions, communicating with the server by loading a full HTML page became a bit cumbersome. In the late 90s, Microsoft introduced an extension to Internet Explorer called XML HTTP Request, or XHR for short. XHR allows the browser to make HTTP requests in the background of a page without reloading it. The XHR objects were accessed through the ActiveX runtime. Later, Mozilla and other browsers implemented XHR in the JavaScript runtime, and it became a W3C working draft. It's now almost ubiquitously implemented in modern browsers. 
The term AJAX is an acronym for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, and is a technique of communicating with the server asynchronously without interfering with the display or the behavior of a page. This is done primarily using the XML HTTP request object. AJAX can be used for a wide variety of things, like loading chunks of HTML into your page, or getting XML or JSON data from the server, or communicating back with the server. The XHR object really doesn't care what kind of response you get, be it HTML, text, JavaScript, or anything else. It's really up to you or the framework you are using to interpret the response. Most JavaScript frameworks offer utilities to make AJAX calls a little bit easier, but it's important to know what's going on under the hood. We'll look at one of these frameworks next, but now let's look at AJAX using plain old JavaScript. First, we need to get an XHR object. How we get this object differs in IE and other browsers, so we will add some code to resolve some of the browser issues. We check to see if XML HTTP request is undefined. If it is, we're going to create our own version of the XML HTTP request function. In our version of XML HTTP request, we try multiple ActiveX calls to try to find the XHR object. We wrap each one in a try-catch block so that if it fails, we can just try the next one. If none of them work, we throw an error because XHR is not supported in this browser. It is a lot of boilerplate code, but it is necessary to get it working in all major browsers. You can find the code at the show notes at doctype.tv. We can now create our request object. This request object will be used only once for the call we want to make. We attach a listener to on ready state change. This function will get called every time the request object's ready state changes. The ready state is a number 0 through 4 representing the various states that a request could be in, like uninitialized, open, receiving, or completed. The completed state is usually what we're interested in, since the data has been loaded. This is represented by state 4, so we check to see if the ready state equals 4. If so, we're ready to handle our data. From there, we check the status of our request to make sure no error has occurred. Usually a 200 status code indicates a success. We can access the raw text of our response body through the response text property. If our response is XML, we can use the response XML property to access an XML tree of our response. We have to attach the listener before we make the request because the request itself will be made asynchronously, executing in parallel with the rest of our code. Now we open the connection using the open method. This takes three arguments. The first is the HTTP method we want to use, such as get or post. Second is the URL of your page, and this must be on the same domain as the page you're running the JavaScript from. See episode three for more details on that. And the third one is true, and this indicates that the request should be asynchronous. The last thing we do is call send. Send takes a string that will be sent as the body of the request. Since in this example we are doing a get, there is no body and we pass null. If it were a post request, we could pass our form encoded data to send. After calling send, the JavaScript code after it will execute immediately. It will not wait for the request to complete. Hence, it's asynchronous. Optionally, before we call send, we could call set request header on the request one or more times to set any HTTP headers we want on the request. Now it can be a bit fatiguing to use the straight JavaScript code for all your AJAX requests. It can also be error prone too since there is so much code. Fortunately, almost all JavaScript frameworks provide AJAX utilities to make AJAX a little bit easier. We're going to look at AJAX in jQuery. If you want to use another framework, take a look at its documentation for more details. If you'd like to get started with jQuery, check out episode 1 of Doctype where we get you up and running with jQuery. AJAX calls are made using the jQuery.ajax or $ajax function. AJAX takes an object of key value pairs that configure the request. These are the common ones. Success is a callback function that will be called if the response is successful. That is, the request is in ready state 4 and the status is 200. URL is the URL to which you want to make your request. Type is the HTTP method you want to use for the request. A more appropriate name for this option would have been method, but it's type. Data is the string that will be sent in the body of the request. This is what will be passed to send behind the scenes. If you pass an object, jQuery will automatically convert it into a form encoded string, which is pretty handy. Data type allows jQuery to process the response body intelligently before it calls the success callback. Based on this parameter, the data argument to success will be different. When it's XML, it'll send an XML object. When it's JSON, it'll send a JavaScript object. When it's text, it'll return a plain string. And when it's HTML, it'll return a string. And any script tags will be executed when the HTML is inserted into the page. When you put it all together, it looks a little something like this. There's no need to manually tell the request to go, it'll send itself automatically. There are also a number of AJAX convenience functions, which simplify a number of the common uses of AJAX. Check them out at the jQuery documentation. 
If you've never been to a Bar Camp event, then Bar Camp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Bar Camp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Bar Camp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.com. Org. That's it for this week. Be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. Also, if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via RSS or iTunes, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So until next Tuesday, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype. <laughs>